Simon Kainer is the head of the Center of Archaeology and Heritage at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Culture. He is also the director of the Center for Japanese Studies at the University of East Anglia. On a personal note, I should mention that I've known Simon for over a decade because I was based in London until very recently, until last year, and Simon and I both worked uh, with the Sainsbury Institute. I've had the pleasure of attending many of Simon's lectures. I also know a lot about his research over the years. I've watched many important publications come to fruition. I remember one of the very first projects that Simon worked on was with Professor Kobayashi Tatsuo, Jomon Reflections, Forager Life and Culture in the Prehistoric Japanese Archipelago, which was a seminal work on Japanese archaeology. It looked at the chronology of Jomon culture and broke new ground, literally, in investigating the ancient past of Japan. Now, if you ask me to pick one publication of Simon's that I enjoyed most, I think Simon already knows that it's the exhibition catalog he edited for the British Museum, The Power of Dogu Ceramic Figures from Ancient Japan. This was an exhibition at the British Museum that I think opened everyone's eyes to the enchanting quality of dogu clay figurines. We have a few examples up in the galleries right now, but if you saw this exhibition, you would realize what a, a fascinating area of study it is, as demonstrated by the fact that the same exhibition from the British Museum went back to Japan for a homecoming exhibition at Tokyo National Museum. And there we saw the very same exhibition displayed in a totally different way. And I remember, and this was my impression, that each dogu figurine was illuminated as though it was a precious little Buddhist statue. And it was a wonderful, but a totally different effect. To, so to see both exhibitions was a very enlightening experience. Simon is, has broader interest in European archaeology as well. He's working on a volume envisioning medieval towns in Japan and Europe. He also has now expanded his duties as director for the Center for Japanese Studies to build a new program up at the University of East Anglia, and I know that he's been very much engaged with that. Simon very kindly yesterday went through some of our archaeological artifacts that are in storage and also commented on some of the works that we have on display. It was uh, quite uh, insightful to hear his comments from very many years of his own investigations, including going on uh, archaeological digs. I should mention that this entire evening and Simon's very present presence here is made possible by uh, John C. Weber, who is with us this evening. And I should also mention that John has very kindly lent to the exhibition upstairs one of his own uh, Jomon flame pots. Uh, please, if you have an opportunity, if you haven't already seen it, go up after the lecture to take a look at this a magnificent, dynamic pot made in prehistoric Japan. Now it just remains for me to turn the podium over to Simon and welcome him here to New York. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, John, for that very kind and warm introduction. It's wonderful to be here in this splendid city. I do apologize to you for today because I seem to have brought some London weather with me. <laughs> but I was here yesterday and we had a fabulous autumn day, um, which I was able to enjoy looking around a little bit. Flame pots. 
are what we're going to be talking about this evening. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my engagement with these rather fine objects over the last 15 years or so, I suppose, since I first had the opportunity to travel up to snow country in Japan, up on the Japan sea coast, which is where these splendid objects have their home. And now, thanks to the uh, vision, I think, of John Weber, there's one living here in New York. And uh, I think that you are all very lucky to have this here, and I'm sure it will become a greatly loved and admired treasure here in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, I started out my title with uh, this word precocious. When John Carpenter invited me to give a talk, I thought, hmm, where, where shall we begin? And um, this word just kept floating into my mind. Um, people have a number of different terms they use to describe these remarkable pottery vessels. And I thought what I wanted to do is give you just a little bit of an introduction as to the way that I think about Jomon archaeology general, generally, this um, extraordinary period of Japanese prehistory, which um, I think probably remains not as well known as it should be, um, either inside Japan or outside Japan. But I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which we're improved, that's being improved on. But I just wanted to give you a few pointers, and I've put them up on the screen for you here. I'm just learning how to use a program called Dragon Speak, which allows you to speak into a computer and it immediately writes down what you're saying. I always say when I'm speaking in Japan that my Japanese audience have to put up with my, my Norfolk Ben in terms of my Japanese. Um, here in New York, you just have to put up with my Igirisunor Ben, I suppose. Anyway, so why precocious? Well, I think there are a number of factors, and if you could just bear these in mind while we're going through um, looking at, I've got lots of pictures to show us. Um, first of all, it's amongst the earliest pottery made anywhere in the world. Maybe not quite the earliest, but we'll have a look at that in a moment. Secondly, it's made by people who were living in some of the earliest village communities, supported by an amazingly efficient food production methodologies and storage, which allowed them to stay in the same place all year round. The trick to remember here is that these people were not farmers. They were entirely dependent on the natural resources which they found around them. Now, they were natural resources, but these foragers had incredibly detailed knowledge of the plants and animals that they were exploiting. And we can see that in particular through their way that they were in get making lacquer. We have some of the earliest lacquer in the world um, from prehistoric Japan. They had a tremendous sense of design. And I'm sure that when you first see the flame pot upstairs in the Japanese galleries, that's one of the first things that will strike you. Tremendous creative flair, which speaks of a tremendous desire to be on display. And the importance of display to these Jomon foragers is really something that coming from dark European prehistory filled me with wonder when I first encountered these pots. And this sense of design and this desire to be on display grows out of a complex set of worldviews, including some sort of dualistic concepts, it seems. Certainly concepts of numbers, very early, and also intriguing notions of transformation. And we'll come back to each of those in the course of this evening's talk. They knew about farming. They knew that the Chinese were farming wet rice, paddy rice, on the other side of the sea from about 9,000 years ago, it seems. But they chose not to take it up. And we'll think a little bit about that too. And we, even without farming, they had a very sustainable and resilient lifestyle, which allowed them to continue this wonderful tradition for over 10,000 years. Yesterday, we were, when we were looking at the objects in the, uh, in the storerooms here, I was just trying to emphasize just how long a period that is 
for prehistorians to try and get their heads around. So, of course, we divide it up. And I'll give you an indication of how we can divide it up in a little bit. They were very social creatures. And they had extended social networks, despite living in relatively autonomous communities. And they also seem to have been very stubbornly egalitarian. And they had all sorts of special ways, I suspect, all sorts of mechanisms for avoiding the inherited social hierarchies, which later on, once farming arrived, were to lead eventually to state-level societies, which, which we are more familiar in Japan. So, just to orientate ourselves a little bit, here we are in the Japanese archipelago, off the, uh, the main coast of the East Asian continent. And this evening, I'm going to take you, as I say, up to the snow country, this area up here, on the coast of Niigata and into the mountains on the Niigata and Nagano border. Before we go there, though, we're going to head up to the north tip of Honshu, which is where my story about pottery in Japan really begins. And it begins with a site called Odai Yamamoto, a little tiny hamlet about 25 miles to the west of Aomori City. And an archaeologist from one of the great universities in Tokyo, Kokugakuin University, very famous archaeological tradition, an archaeologist by the name of Yasuhiro Taniguchi, was invited to go up to Odai Yamamoto to investigate a couple of trenches that had been dug in advance of one of the local farmers building an extension on their farmhouse. And he had a look here at Odayama, sort of site number one, and he also had a look just here at Odayama, Odayama model number two. And he found a number of rather unprepossessing looking pottery fragments associated with some stone axes and other stone tools. And it wasn't until he got back to the laboratory and sent off some of the fragments for some radiocarbon dating that the magnitude of his discovery really came home to roost. Now, if you look at these fragments, you'll notice that some of them are a little bit blackened in colour. I always like to say that these Jomon foragers were not very good at washing up. And that's a real advantage to us archaeologists because there are carbonized accretions on the back of these pottery fragments. And it's possible using radiocarbon dating to get pretty accurate dates. And nobody was more surprised than Professor Taniguchi when the dates came back and there was a whole range of dates suggesting that these pottery fragments came from a pottery vessel made some 16,000 years ago. Now that is firmly in what we would describe as the Paleolithic. We're expecting people to be hunting after big game animals. We're not really expecting them to be making pottery vessels at all. Now, it's just possible that those Jomon foragers in Aomori have been picked at the post by some other foragers in South China. And in June this year, Professor Ofa Bar Yosef, one of the most distinguished archaeologists of the Paleolithic and Neolithic of the Near East that we have, it's based at Harvard University, announced the discovery of what he described as fragments from a pottery cauldron from the Shandenrong Cave in Jiangxi Province in southern China and radiocarbon dates from these fragments came back at about 20,000 years ago. Now, it's possible that there are bits of contamination that creep into archaeology as an imprecise science. One needs to always retain a critical skepticism towards new data like this. But what is now clear, and has become clear over the last 10 years, since the discovery at Oda Yamamoto, is that in East Asia, in China, in the Japanese archipelago, and in the 
Russian Far East in the Amur River Valley, we have ceramics at least 10,000 years old, and these are the oldest ceramics in the world. Now that unprepossessing little pot that was discovered at Oda Yamamoto, which was reconstructed to look like a little hand, probably a little handheld flat-bottomed vessel that was about 11 inches in height, not very big, gave birth to one of the most remarkable expressions of prehistoric creativity, I believe, that we have anywhere in the world. I would put these pots on a par with the Paleolithic cave paintings of the Dordoin. Over a period of 10,000 years, we have a wide range of pottery styles being made throughout the Japanese archipelago. As I said, these are made by foragers who are subsisting entirely on wild food resources, things like nuts, wild tubers, mountain potatoes, lily bulbs, wild animals like deer, wild boar, flying squirrel, even tanuki, even raccoon dog seems to have got on the menu sometimes, and fish, in particular salmon and shellfish. They had very rich, seasonally available resources. We now have a range of about two, two to three hundred very early pottery sites in the Japanese archipelago. So we have much higher numbers than we do currently from elsewhere in East Asia. Here's just one of these sites, a site called Ojikakubo, which is in Shizuoka Prefecture, in sight of that iconic symbol of Japan, Mount Fuji. Excavations revealed, what we see at the bottom of the slide, a plan of some houses. And as I said, the Jomon people seem to have built some of the earliest village communities that we know about from anywhere in the world. From around about 11,000 years ago, these Jomon foragers are living in relatively settled villages made of pit houses dug into the soil, and they seem to have been repeatedly going back to the same locations time and time again. Now, they're not only making pottery containers. They also make a whole range of other ceramic objects. And some of the most evocative ones are the ones that John Carpenter talked about in his introduction. These dogu, or ceramic figures, or little ceramic figurines. When we were preparing the dogu exhibition for the British Museum, little did we know that exactly while I was finishing off the catalogue, this tiniest example of Dogu was being excavated in Saga Prefecture. Sorry, Shiga Prefecture. I've got that wrong. That's Shiga Prefecture in uh, near um, Osaka in Kyoto at a site called Aidani Kumahara. Little, no legs, no arms, no head. Just a hole where the head might have perhaps been inserted. It's about three centimeters in height and it dates, as I say, to 13,000 years ago. It's the oldest of the prehistoric dogu yet discovered. And that was the precursor of a tradition of other ceramic objects, including this array of some of the finest of the dogu that have yet been discovered. And there are around about 20,000 of these objects and fragments of these objects have been recovered to date. What I'd like to do now is just try and set John Weber's flame pot in the context of the history of the development of Jomon pottery for you and give you a few dates. We have some at the top, some of the earliest vessels, these what we call incipient Jomon vessels, which tend to have their two types. Some have these rounded, sort of slightly baggy bottoms which may be modelled on leather bags or bags made out of animal skins. And another form which are flat-bottomed, rectangular forms, which remind us of some of the birch bark containers 
or basketry containers that we know from the ethnographic record in other parts of the world. But by the time we move into what is called the initial Jomon, after about 5,000 years or so, people have really fixed on these pointed-based vessels. They're deep cooking pots. These are all about preparing things to eat. And it's all related to the major environmental changes which were occurring at the end of the last ice age, when new forest zones were appearing, the large animals, the large uh, elephants and giant deer that the Paleolithic hunters had subsisted on were becoming extinct and they were being replaced by other foodstuffs that needed to be prepared in different ways to make them edible. As we move into the main part of the Jomon period, the early Jomon, temperatures are continuing to warm. Global warming is no new phenomena. It happened several times in the course of the Jomon period. We have these deep cooking vessels decorated with the eponymous Jomon, which just means twisted plant fibers impressed into the surface of the pottery vessels. It means cord marked. That's where the name Jomon comes from. And we start to get a slightly bigger range of pottery vessels, as well as these long, deep pots decorated with very elegant but relatively simple designs, which um, my great uh, inspiration, Professor Kobayashi Tatsuo, recently described as wallpaper for pots. Probably no real meaning to it. It's sort of purely decorative. And you also get these increasing numbers of shallower serving vessels some of which are decorated, painted using lacquer, some of which are painted with different pigments. As time goes by and the, d and the tradition develops even further into the middle, late and final Jormon periods, and this is the period where we're getting closer to those flame pots, we get a tremendous diversification in styles, followed by a period of something like standardization as we come into the final part of the Jomon period. And those non-representational wallpaper designs are complemented by a number of what seem to be more representational or narrative designs. Maybe these pots are now being used to tell stories. They've got meanings for the Jomon people making them. And as we get into the middle Jomon period, we start to find grains of rice and other grass species embedded in the fabric of the clays, which tells us that these people knew about rice, but they don't start growing it properly for themselves for at least another 3,000 years or so. And along the bottom here, we have a range. You can see the range of pots starts to change. We have this, what seems to be maybe a drum. It may have had a leather lid attached to it with that human figure emerging from it. We have a little pottery stand. Yesterday, we were saying that there were no tables in the Jomon period but we do have uh, occasional little stands like this on which particularly important vessels may have been stood and vessels which seem to have been used for lighting their lamps that would have been used for little oil uh, lamps. And as we come into the final part of the Jomon period, even more elaborate forms seem to appear, in particular the spouted vessels, and there's a lovely spouted pot up in the Japanese galleries that you can see. And we also get sets of vessels which seem to come in pairs. For example, on the left, you have a pair of standard or footed um, vessels which um, were found as a set sitting on the bottom of the floor of one of these pit houses. And we also get a kind of dualism in colour. And on the right, we have two lacquered pots. One, the a red pigment has been added to the lacquer, and on the other one, a black pigment has been added to the lacquer. And these are the things that are s leading some Japanese archaeologists to suggest really there is some kind of dual principle behind um, Jomon vessels, Jomon design. And that may reflect that you've got two different groups of people living in individual communities, perhaps exchanging marriage partners, what anthropologists would describe as moieties, um, something that we're familiar with in other parts of the world. Now I'm just going to take you through a few pictures which are not flame pots just to introduce you to some of the cousins of the wonderful vessel that we have upstairs and I just want to plant an idea in your mind 
that maybe these pots are expressions of that notion of transformation. Look at, this, look at the way that some of these images, and they're, they're not people, they're not real individuals being represented, they're more like spirits being represented, I would suggest, but they seem to be emerging from the surface of the pots. Now there's thinking about the Paleolithic art in France at the moment, that the people who are painting those animals on the caves believe that the spirits of those animals were really coming through the walls of the cave and that those cave walls represented a boundary to the other world. And I would like to suggest that maybe on these pots, we the walls of the pots themselves represent the boundary to another world, embodying this notion of transformation. And we can see it with some of these other vessels as well. <coughs> These all date to the middle Jomon period, and the photographs, these wonderful wraparound photographs, are all taken by a man called Ogawa Hiroshi, who's worked very closely with Professor Kobayashi Tatsuo in preparing some of the very large Zenshu, these wonderful compendia of Jomon pots, which allow us to really begin to analyze the design field of these vessels. And I think these photographs just give you an idea of some of the complexity involved spirals are something which certain archaeologists like to interpret again in terms of transformative qualities. Um, these apparently are some of the designs that one sees um, when one is going through a state of transformation perhaps induced by mind-altering substances. Entoptic phenomena they are called. Who knows what's being cooked up in those pots? Maybe there's a, an expertise in the use of mushrooms and alcoholic beverages. And research which is currently going on, analyzing the burnt, the encrusted accretions that I talked about that were also being used to give us radiocarbon dates for these vessels, are now being analyzed in terms of isotopes and chemical signatures of the foodstuffs that they contained. And so we will know in years to come what these pots were being used to cook. This is a very interesting example because what I'd like to focus on is the, is the S motif that you can see running around the pot. It seems that Jomon foragers had a kind of palette of motifs that they were using, that they were drawing on to create their own distinctive styles. And when you look at the flame pots in a moment or two, you'll see something very similar. But this vessel comes from much further north in Honshu. And some of these vessels have apparent scenes of dancing on them. That's, that's a dancing figure making its way around, but nothing quite human. It's a slightly, it's not, a, it's not slightly, it's a very uh, stylized, abstracted version of a human figure. And here we have some more. And perhaps the most striking one for my argument about transformation is this pot at the bottom, which is from Nagano Prefecture, and it dates to about the same time as the flame pots. The mouth of this figure, this wide, go open, gaping mouth, goes right through into the belly of the pot. There are other things that make it apparent that Jomon people inhabited a complex world, but they were able to categorize things and classify things themselves. And this extraordinary recent discovery from a site called Oyu in northern Japan suggests that we have a form of numerical notation being used in the Jomon period. Again, it was Professor Kobayashi who drew my attention to this intriguing piece. It, in some ways, it looks a little bit like a very abstracted version of a dogu. You maybe have two eyes and a mouth and then some body decoration. But look a little closer. Uh, the large hole could be a number one. And above that we have two small holes. And then we have a little cluster of three on the left and four on the right and five going down the middle and six on the back. What do you think? There's a suggestion that the number three had particular significance. Now, I believe that Bart Simpson and his family only have three, six, three fingers on each hand. 
Maybe they're related to these Jomon figures. This extraordinary dogu from a site called Kamikurokoma in Yamanashi Prefecture, which certainly doesn't look very human to me, but it does, again, have overtones of this notion of transformation, perhaps a human transforming itself into a an animal and then transforming itself back into a human. And it's three-fingered hand. The notion of transformation is central to ideas around shamanism. And it's possible that there were some forms of belief that we might recognize as something akin to shamanism being practiced in the Jomon period. There are more numbers. I know in the gallery upstairs, one of the vessels that you have is similar to the, the vessel that I put on the bottom left, where it has these three protruding rims. And there are other vessels that have got five, seven, and nine rims. And indeed, Kobashi has argued that in some parts of the Jomon world, odd numbers seem to have a particular significance. Jomon archaeology today is being rediscovered in Japan. It's undergoing something of a boom. This figurine on the left, which stands to a height of about 25 centimeters, is from a site called Chobonaino in Hokkaido, the southern tip of the Oshima Peninsula in Hokkaido. And it was discovered in the late 1990s by an old lady who was out digging potatoes. And she was a little surprised when instead of knobby old potatoes, up came this beautiful hollow figurine, which seems to be, it seems to buck the trend for many of the Jomondogu, and it seems in bodily proportions to look more male than female. It also seems to have a beard, but it may be a tattoo, and it's wearing this rather natty halter top and a smart pair of cord marked trousers. It is now the only national treasure that we have from the whole island of Hokkaido. And it joins three other dogu in being designated that highest level of cultural value in Japan. A brand new museum was opened last year, one of two museums in northern Japan. And the centerpiece of that museum, it houses the Chobonaino figurine, is what you see just down here. And this is a grave pit from the site of Kakenoshima, dating to about 9,000 years ago. And in that pit was discovered a red lacquered blanket. And it seems that the deceased person was wrapped up in that blanket and then placed in the grave. Archaeologists dated it using radiocarbon dating, and that is now the oldest lacquer that we have from anywhere in the world. Well, only it would be if there hadn't been a terrible accident and the site hut burnt down and the lacquer blanket and the associated artifacts were destroyed. These people on the lower part of the screen are not midgets. <laughs> they are standing in some of the largest examples of Jomon architecture that we have. Now, most of the Jomon buildings are relatively simple pit-style houses where the floors have been excavated out to a depth of perhaps 20 to 50 centimeters. But you can see this, in particular, this photograph on the right. The floor is nearly two meters below ground level. On the left, those ladies who were involved in the excavation of the site are standing in what remains of the post holes of a post-built hall-style building, some of which are up to 30 metres in length. So they're substantial structures, and we think that perhaps we've got multiple families living in these structures, perhaps they're all through the winter, because in these areas we have very deep snowfalls of up to three to five metres. Elsewhere, we have other figurines coming out of the ground, like this is another recent one, um, a praying or a clasped hand figure sitting down, probably female, we think, wearing a mask like so many of the dogu that we know about, coming from a site called Kazahadi, number one in Aomori, 
at the towards the end of the Jomon period. And we have houses, those circular, those dark circles that you can see there, surrounding clusters of graves. And they are what you can see circled in white. And from this site, we have carbonized rice grains from a fireplace, which have been radiocarbon dated to a thousand years BC. These people, again, they weren't growing their own rice. They must have been importing it from somewhere. And perhaps they were just intrigued by what this mysterious white substance was all about. And it's not for another thousand years that rice is actually being grown in this part of Japan. This figurine, the Kazahari figurine, had became rather iconic during the terrible events of March 2011. Because the figurine was found in Hachinohe City, which was on the Pacific coast, which was one of the towns that was inundated by that terrible giant wave. And we were able to put in a little bit of coverage of some of those wonderful archaeological sites in northeastern Japan. And we're involved at the moment in working with archaeologists in the area to see how this sense of archaeology, that sense of historical consciousness and awareness can help with the recovery efforts that are going to take many, many years. Just to give you a flavor of what the communities that many of these Jomon foragers who are making the flame pots may have lived in, here's a photograph of a beautifully excavated, complete plan of a Jomon village dating to about 3,500 BC, about the same time that these flame pots were being made. You'll notice it's got a sort of a circular pattern. There's a ring of buildings surrounding a relatively empty central plaza or space, which is where we think maybe that's where the pots were being made. And outside the ring of houses, there's a ring of storage pits. And beyond the ring of storage pits, there are wonderful rubbish pits, which are treasure houses for the archaeologists, because that's where all the goodies come from. And we can reconstruct what one of these Jomon settlements looks like in this way. We have a series of small pit houses, perhaps occupied by individual family groups, interspersed with larger raised floor storage features. And in the centre, maybe something that perhaps in this part of the world would be recognised as uh, totem poles, but uh, something marking out graves of important people. Using our archaeological imaginations, we can reconstruct what the upper structures of these buildings might have looked like. And I would ask you, when you look at the flame pot upstairs, to imagine you're in rather a gloomy Jomon pit house with a fireplace at the centre. And in the centre of the fireplace, one of these splendid Jomon pots used for cooking. Cooking and eating being right at the heart of the Jomon cultural experience. We know, as I said, that people went back or they lived in the same places for many years. And we know that because we can see them rebuilding those houses in exactly the same place, maybe in slightly different style or slightly different size as more children arrived or as individual family members died off or moved away. But here's a lovely chain of pit houses. And this is evidence that we don't find in other parts of the world of the rebuilding of houses in the same way um, amongst forager communities. And these have been reconstructed, such as here in uh, the city of Chino in Nagano Prefecture. This is the site of Togari Ishi, one of the very first sites to be settlements to be excavated in the 1940s, and one of the first sites where experimental archaeology was used to try and rebuild what these houses might have looked like. Now, normally, Archaeologists don't find anybody at home when they're excavating. But here at Ubayama, Shelmiden, excavated in the 1950s, there are three generations of the same family group were found around the central pot. And who knows, maybe it was the contents of that central pot that led to their demise. And those of you familiar with Japan will be familiar, I'm sure, with legends surrounding the fugu, or the blower fish. I trick you not, bones of fugu have been found from Jomon sites. We can reconstruct what these communities may have looked like, and this is 
a little fanciful, but we use information from the dogu and from archaeology to suggest that people were very concerned about their personal appearance. They have elaborate hairdos. They have beautiful lacquered hair combs. The figurines suggest that they're aware of clothes. We know, we've seen from the pots, that they have a colour sense. And some of the artefacts that we find, such as these, about 900 beautiful, exquisite, three-dimensional ceramic ear ornaments, which are placed in the ear lobe. So what they must have been doing is making an incision in the ear lobe and then inserting first a small ceramic ear ornament and then gradually over time larger and larger ones. And the largest of these are about 10 centimetres in diameter. And there are some objects which really bring the Jomon people very close to us. This from Kakenoshima, this site that had that very deep pit house in Hokkaido. We have a series of ceramic tablets. They're decorated with cord marking. I think you can see that. They're also decorated with the impressions of the hands and feet of infants. And then they're pierced and they seem to have been worn as pendants. And we know that Jomon people were burying their children when they didn't survive either birth or that they didn't survive infancy. These infants were buried under the floors of the Jomon houses in the pots, unlike the adults who were buried away from the house areas. Well, I said that these Jomon foragers inhabit quite a rich world view. And here is a little reconstruction of the Jomon universe as put together by Professor Kobayashi Tatsuo, who's done a lot of work setting Jomon settlements in their landscape. And he knows, for example, he's been able to track this, that some of the settlements and their monuments are aligned on the movements of celestial bodies, in particular the sun and quite possibly the moon. And this is no surprise from a European perspective, because of course we know we have things like the great sun temple at Stonehenge. And Stonehenge, the early stages of Stonehenge, are dated to exactly the same time as our flame pots, about 3500 BC. So, turning to the main course, if you like, let's have a detailed look at these flame pots and where they come from. The Sea of Japan coast and the Shinano River Valley, along with the Chikuma River in Nagano Prefecture. This is the longest river system in Japan, about 350 kilometers altogether, starting from the coast and heading down into the central mountains. We have a whole series of pottery style zones which have been identified by archaeologists. They've actually identified about 70 major style zones and about 400 minor local, local styles of Jomon pottery which suggests that these, and because of the shared motifs, we know that many of these communities would have been in communication with each other. Here are the terraces of the Shinano River, which is where many of the sites that are producing the flame pots come from. And this is where I've been fortunate enough to be excavating with my colleagues from the Niigata Prefectural Museum of History, looking at one of the earliest sites producing these flame vessels. They're produced in really quite sizable numbers, although we have hardly any, really hardly any, outside Japan, which is what makes John Weber's pot so hugely valuable to have here in New York. This is the reconstructed assemblage from a site called Sasayama, which is in um, the middle reaches of the Shinano River, excavated in uh, the early 1990s, over 900 flame pots were recovered and subsequently designated a national treasure in their own right. And if you go today to the town of Tokamachi in the middle of the Shinano River, in the local museum there, they've built a special gallery to house these 900 vessels. That was the newspaper article announcing the designation as national treasure. People in the area are quite proud of these pots. Here we have the railway station at Nagaoka, 
which is the main center. And as you come out in from the main concourse, there's a great big replica flame pot that greets you. And as you walk up the road, there are wonderful manhole covers with flame pots on them as well, just in case you're not sure where you are. A historic route, the Shinanogawa Kaien Kaido, has been set up. And you can now travel from the city of Niigata all the way down upriver to the border with Nagano Prefecture, visiting these sites. Here's the Sanka site where I've been working. Here's the Sasayama site that we've been talking about, visiting these sites and museums on your way. And such is the level of excitement that when a new town area was laid out in Nagaoka a few years ago, a park was designed. And of course, at the center of the park, there's a lovely maze in the shape of a flame pot. These are the people who discovered the flame pots. This is the Kondo family who owned the site, the type site called Umataka, and they made their first discoveries in the 1930s. Much more recently, in the, 19, in the 2000s, the site has been extensively investigated by the archaeologists from Nagaoka City. And we know that there are two main settlements at Umataka, which, as I say, is the type site. This is where the flame pots were first identified and named. We have a northern settlement and a southern settlement. And we have a whole series of houses, house pits, have been discovered. Averaging from about 10 metres in diameter to anything up to about 30 metres in diameter. And this is where these flame pots were coming from. And there are also figurines from these sites. The new on-site museum, their most valued possession is Miss Umataka, uh, which is this figurine um, on di proudly on display in the museum. And if you go in, you can see wonderful dioramas. We don't see enough dioramas in museums anymore. Um, you can walk through these scenes and really get a sense of what life was like in the Joe. These are all life-size um, in the Joe one period. Now, in the last little bit of time we've got left, I want to take you through a little bit of the science, um, which I hope will help you look at the flame pot that we have in the gallery upstairs and understand a little bit of why the archaeologists get so excited about them. And most of what I'm going to be showing you comes from a recent exhibition held at the University Museum of the University of Tokyo, which was curated by Professor <coughs> um, Kunio who is one of the leading, Kunio Yoshida, who is one of the leading specialists in radiocarbon dating in Japan. They did a lot of work looking at how the pots were made. They're coil pots. They're made without a potter's wheel. And once the basic pot has been formed using these rolled out coils of clay, the decoration is applied, an applique decoration afterwards. And then the pots are fired outside to temperatures of perhaps between 500 to 900 degrees centigrade. There are two main forms of flame pot. The first are the flame style flame pots, and that's the one at the top. And the second is what is called a crown style flame pot, an orkangata pot because of its rectangular pointer looks a little bit like a medieval crown. And here are these pots with those wonderful wraparound photographs. Let's have a look at some of the elements, the design elements that make them up. These pots are relatively symmetrical, unlike many other Jomon vessels where asymmetry seems to be the order of the day. They have these very elaborate protruding rims. And those on the flame style pots are interpreted as looking like chickens' coxcombs. The only problem with that is that we know there were no chickens in the Jomon period. Another interpretation is they look like salmon tails, as the salmon are splashing around in the river um, during the autumn salmon run. There are holes 
on these pots. So there's very three-dimensional sculptures, and the holes take me back to what I was saying about that transformative nature of these vessels. Here we have the reason we call them flame pots. These are the little tips of flames or flames licking their way around the rims of the pots. And imagine, if you will, that these pots are being used in those dark and gloomy Jomon pit houses in the centre of the fireplace. And you can imagine the smoke and the flame from the fireplace flickering around the pot, creating a sense of movement, casting shadows and forming the backdrop to perhaps stories that are being told by these Jomon foragers. We have clearly demarcated um, tops of the rims and we also have what seem to be remnant handles. These are described as dragonflies eyes or tombonome. And we have a very similar set of features on the crown pots. The symmetry, those protruding rims, those flaring bits. On the crown pots, however, there are not those flickering flames that we see on the flame style pots. And that's why archaeologists consider they belong to the same style, that Kayin Gata style or the flame style of Jomon pottery. They're not really Jomon, it has to be said, because there's not any cord marking in evidence on these vessels. It's all applied and incised decoration. And the archaeologists have been doing some x-ray analysis of these pots to see exactly how they were made and you can see that they were applique decoration because as the piece on the bottom left shows sometimes as they're dug out of the ground and then re re restored we've lost some of that applique decoration from the original part of the pot there's been some very interesting analysis done of all of these design features by and by a man called Imafuku Rike from the Yamanashi Prefectural Museum and he's identified a number of design motifs and using some network analysis he suggests that what we have here there's about 50 of the Jomon of the, the sites that produced flame pots he argues that all of these lines indicate connections between the different sites. Now we know that there are connections from the Jomon across to the Asian continent as far as China. This little polished stone axe, for example, probably came from northeastern China somehow into the northern part of Japan in the later part of the Jomon period. And we know that exotic commodities, especially green stones, these are not jade, but they're jadeite. And there is only one known source of jadeite in Japan, and that is in Niigata Prefecture, close to where the flame pots are being made. And these green stone objects, which include beautiful slit stone earrings, polished stone axes and pendants, are found all around the Japanese archipelago, again suggesting that people are in regular contact with each other. Now, what kind of contact might that have been? Here we have a legend of Jomon love. This is very nice. This is from an exhibition in the Niigata, in, sorry, in the Nagano Prefectural Museum. This is called a Daigi style pot, but it is made at the same time as a flame style pot. And it comes from a site that is some five meters beneath the current ground surface. It's ended up there as a result of tectonic shifts. The suggestion is that this young man set out from his village with a pot that his mother had made and he arrives in a neighbouring village quite a long way away and he falls in love with the young girl and he presents her with the pot that his mum's made. And we can see all the elements and uh, this little character here which has been picked up and is used to illustrate, to guide you through the exhibition. And the young man tells this girl about where he comes from, the culture of the snow country where he was born, and then he goes off on his travels, and in this story he doesn't come back. But he leaves the girl with the pot, and she starts to use the similar design elements, and maybe that's one way in which these communications were taking place. There's been actually some scientific backup for that in terms of analysing the clays that were used in the pot. And while most 
of the flame pots are made of local clays. There are, on some sites, pots which are made of clays from other places, suggesting that these pots are indeed moving around. And a number of scientific analyses, including these CAT scans, the analysis of this is um, a scanning electron microscopic analysis of the fabric of the clay, and we can see that there are plant fibers being used for tempering the clay. And perhaps most importantly, we have thin section analysis. This is the scale along the bottom is about five millimeters. This is just a little bit of pottery. And using very high resolution magnification, it's possible to see all of the elements that are included in the clay. And then by using a technique called X-ray diffraction, you can work out the chemical composition of those clays. There's a lot of science going on to give us an idea of what's happening. And this is then all confirmed with radiocarbon dating. Um, and we now have our own calibration curve from Japan which takes us back to a fixed sequence that takes us back to about 1500 BC, about 3,500 years ago, and a floating sequence that takes us back even before that. And these new radiocarbon dates are allowing us to get a clear idea of the chronological sequence in which these pots are being made. And here we have um, these pots and the standard deviation on either side of these dates um, for the flame pots themselves. And we now know that those pots were made between about 3,500 and 3,000 BC. These kind of very precise radiocarbon dates, which are also being used in Europe, are leading archaeologists to suggest that maybe prehistory is being abolished because the detail of the radiocarbon is now so accurate that we can divide prehistory up into 25-year spans, which of course is one human lifetime, one generation. We're getting more and more historical all the time. We know that not every household had flame pots. And we know that there are perhaps buildings on these sites where you have particular concentrations of flame pots. And this is a little distribution map from an another flame pot site called Dorkun Mai. But what we don't seem to have is the accumulation of large quantities of flame pots in any of the burials. At the beginning, I said there is no evidence for inherited social status differences in the Jomon period. And this is one of the things that suggests that that's the case. The flame pots come to an end at about 2500 BC and they're replaced by these much simpler pottery vessels decorated with fingernail impressions and incisions. And this Sanju and Abba style leads us into a period of much greater standardization of pottery styles that takes us to the end of the Jomon period. And I'm just going to introduce one site which gives us an idea of the richness of what's happening at the end of the Jomon period, a site which again is buried about five meters beneath the current land surface, this time in the Niigata Plain. And ex investigations prior to the construction of a new motorway uncovered a Jomon settlement dating to about 1000 BC, where we had the remains of the foodstuff that people were eating preserved in situ in the waterlogged deposits. And these are pits full of nuts. We also have the architectural timbers are left behind. And we're able to reconstruct what the buildings may have looked like, as well as the plans of those settlements. We have dug out canoes, which are perhaps the form of the preferred means of transportation as these people are taking their pots around. And we're able, from the material record that we've got, to reconstruct what these people in the final Jomon period may have looked like. And here's a little reconstruction of that settlement. Just to wrap up now, I want to tempt you to come over and see these pots, not only in the gallery upstairs. I hope that will just whet your appetite. As John mentioned, We've had, this is the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, where 
we were able to put some flame pots on display back in 2001. I think this is calligraphy by your very own Japanese curator here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We treated them as art objects, and I think there's no question that these objects, although they're from prehistory, should be measured in terms of their artistic merit, as well as what they can tell us about life in the past. At the British Museum, the director has been inspired to include Joe Montpots in his History of the World in 100 Objects. This is rather a special one because it was probably discovered in the 18th century and the antiquarians who found it turned it into a mizusashi for the tea ceremony. And most recently, we've been able to borrow two pots, a flame pot and a crown style pot for an exhibition at the British Museum, which will run until January 2013. So any of you who are passing through, do come and have a look and this is my opportunity to introduce you to some of my colleagues, without whom I wouldn't have been able to do any of this research. In particular, Professor Kobayashi Tatsuo, Mr. Miao Toru, Mr. Ogumu Hiroshi, who excavated at the Umetaka site over the last few years, and so inspired not only well, museum directors, but we were also very fortunate to have the mayor of Nagaoka City, who flew in especially with a crate of Niigata sake to help us celebrate <laughs> the arrival of the pots. And here they are. And to make sure that, because it's very tactile, these pottery vessels, you really want to be able to touch them and hold them, there is a group in Niigata who specialize in making the cord twists. And we have a lovely sort of a touch, touchy-feely exhibit included as well, so you can really feel what they were like. Of course, if you can't make it to the British Museum, then perhaps you can make it to the Shinano River yourselves and visit some of those splendid museums that are there. And there you can go and see them in all their glory in the Niigata Prefectural Museum of History, where some of those 900 pots from Sasayama are exhibited. And while you're in Japan this winter, do stop in at the Miho Museum in Shiga Prefecture, just up the road from where that tiny little figurine from <coughs> Aidani Kumahara was discovered where we have the Dogu Cosmos on display until December the 9th. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>